I do think we are overcomplicating things. We are a hundred percent. Not to mention the hyper competition comparison. I think parents really have this drive. It's evolutionary that our children aren't left behind on the savanna, right? Yeah. But how that's converting into modern day life is, well, they have to get in the best colleges to live a good life and be okay when that's actually not true. A few times in Who's Missing History, we have recorded live and in person, not live, but in person. And I love it. And I want to do more of it. And I can't think of a better person to have invited into my home the neighbor of mine, Emily Evelyn, and also, I mean, a fellow Emily, all Emilies, always welcome. Emily is a clinical psychologist and author. She has a brilliant book out called Autonomy Supportive Parenting. And I have to say, as someone who came into the parenting game late in life, <laughs> I was looking around and thinking to myself, huh. Okay, so there's a lot there's a lot to do here and a lot of pressure put on people. And so what I love about Emily's approach is two things. One, it's research based. This is not just something she came up with. There is so much to learn and read to support this way of raising children, which has everything to do with autonomy. And as someone whose top value is independence in my life, it really resonates with me. Spoiler alert. I hope you enjoy the conversation. So what do your parents have to say about this time in your life? I would love to hear about that. My my mom lives in Oak Park. Okay. And my dad died like 20 years ago. So... There's not any upside to death, except sometimes there is. Like, we got really close. So mm -hmm. she is routinely sort of playing, like, what's new kind of thing, but is so proud yes. of everything. Yes. So say, what are your parents' names? Carol and Carl. Stop it. Yes. Oh, they're cute already. And I have to tell you the backstory Please. of our last names. We all have different last names. Tell me. So my parents got married in 1974. Okay. Both of my parents are very established feminists. Mm -hmm. And so my mother refused to change her last name mm -hmm. because of the tradition that goes along with that of being property. What a renegade. Yeah. In 74. In 74. And my dad is also a renegade because he's like, sure. Right? Wow. And I'm their only child. So they combined their middle names, Edward and Lynn, for my last name. Oh, my gosh. So that is why I could not ever change it when mm -hmm. I got married. Mm -hmm. And now my children have the longest hyphenated names <laughs> that exist. <laughs> They're good. <laughs> I'm like, no, you can't hyphenate when you get married because then you yeah. don't have enough boxes on the government forms. <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. So when you say they were feminist, how did you know they were feminist growing up? My mother proposed to my father, mm -hmm. and they actually were not legally married mm -hmm. for decades mm -hmm. Ooh. because of the name issue, because they got married in Ohio. It wasn't legal okay. because she didn't take his name. So I think just seeing how they would buck the norms. Mm -hmm even, you know, way back then mm -hmm. really stood out to me. And of course, any sort of media consumption, my mom would be talking about how the women were portrayed. And so it was always in my head. And of course, when I was younger, I'm rolling my eyes at her. And now I do the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How are you like Carol? Well, she is also a therapist. Really? So yes. Okay. So I would say we are both very nurturing mm -hmm. by nature mm -hmm. and uh, very into our families mm -hmm. and prioritizing that 
over mm-hmm. everything else. So, mm-hmm. and Carl, how are you like Carl? So Carl, <laughs> hi Carl, hi Carl. You know he's, he's listening. He is like the mayor wherever he goes. So everyone knows Carl. He's a major extrovert. Mm-hmm. He was always a writing mentor for me growing up because I was always in love with writing and he yeah. would read everything I wrote and give me feedback. <laughs> he was also my grammar police. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And he's also an entrepreneur. He had his own business that became really successful. And so I think I have a lot of both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So obviously we both have the same first name. Yes. <laughs> we also are both only children. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And we also went to college with an English major as sort of the outcome. So tell us about since college, undergrad, how did you make the decision about what to do next with your life? So I actually made that decision when I was 10. Okay. I, yes. <laughs> Very unusually. No, no, no. This focused is, child. I love it. Yeah. Okay. So 10 years old. 10 how years did, old. Tell us about the moment. Well, prior to that, I either wanted to be a professional softball player or a dancer. Sure. And then somehow something cleared and like reality. (laughs) Oh, reality. (laughs) Showed itself. (laughs) And I wanted to be a child psychologist. Mm -hmm. I mean, even as a child, I loved taking care of younger kids. Mm -hmm. As I was a teenager, I would work as a camp counselor and I always gravitated towards those kids that needed more. Yeah. that were on the outside and struggling and my heart just always went to them. Do you think your awareness of child psychology is because of your mom or influenced by your mom in any way? Or how did you know that was a thing? I'm not sure. Did you go to actually. a psychologist? I didn't. As a kid? I did not. No. That I remember. I, I don't, it, you know, it was the 80s. It wasn't as right. common. Right. Maybe we were tricked and we were actually in therapy at some point. (laughs) I don't don't know. Yeah. I did have a recurring nightmare when I was three. So I had a few sessions. Okay. I have zero memory. Yeah. Except for the nightmare itself. Was there anything in your background that, you know, as a kid, you didn't want other kids to go through? I do think I often felt not like other kids. Yeah. Um, I was acutely aware of feeling different. Mm-hmm. I don't feel that way as an adult. Mm-hmm. So it was a very, I was a really early reader. I had a very like sophisticated vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And I think I just didn't connect mm-hmm. with a lot of kids. I remember once going to a birthday party, I think we're around five. And I was so excited to give my friend a pack of like my favorite books. And she opened the gift. And I remember this so well in front of all the kids. And she's like, books? why would I want books? And she like threw it to the side. (laughs) My God. When did you start to find your people as a kid? Did you find other nerds eventually? I did. Because we're all a little nerdy. I went to an extremely small school. So I didn't have it for K through eight. So I didn't have a lot of variety. But I did have really, like I had one best friend from grade school that we were still friends in high school that kind of crossed into high school. And then in high school, I found my people. Yeah, I was always able to find where I could click. I was never bullied. I was never teased. I was never marginalized. I really wasn't. I don't know, in your experience, in your profession, that feels like it would be an out an outlier that you're not experiencing. Well, I really get tired of talking about social media and Great. cell phones, but... That wasn't a thing. I know. And I think that amplifies a lot of opportunity for mm-hmm. some of that. I'm also sure I had much feelings of being left out. I just, they're kind of a blur. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're listening and you're feeling left out and ostracized in some way, you might not even remember, remember. it later. <laughs> Good news. Good news. <laughs> As you age, things fade. <laughs> Yeah, so you always had this, like, yeah, the sense at 10, at 10 of, like, I want to do this. And then how did you, do you remember feeling, like, also, like, I will be good at this? And when that happened for you. And this being a child psychologist. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Like I remember one summer, the summer I turned 16, I worked at a camp designed for children in foster homes. Mm. And so they definitely had higher needs and more emotional issues. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being so taken by these children and they left an impression on me that I'm still talking about to this day, but it definitely shaped my passion for this is who I want to help. So I did spend years working in child protection, working in child abuse and neglect systems, and thought when I went to graduate school that would be my path. Mm. And I burned out on it. It became just too emotionally overwhelming. Mm. And it's like I put all my energy into it for a few years in my youth with the stamina I had back then. Mm -hmm. And then it just, it became too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My clinical training was at Children's Home and Aid in part, uh, and then I did part of it in another place and had the same experience of like, gosh, both my folks are Chicago public school teachers. Oh, yeah. So the, the message I got growing up uh, was you can do anything but be a teacher. They were sort of like trying. <laughs> Please don't do this. Please don't do this. <laughs> And lo and behold, here I am, you know, sort of like facilitating in the world and, and for all intents and purposes teaching. But yeah, that the child welfare system um, and just the the burnout in working in the field of child right. services is, yeah. yeah, it's exceptional. Yeah, it's exceptional. So you go to graduate school immediately after? Undergrad? No. So, oh. yeah. So you went to Hollywood. No, I <laughs> Yeah, that was later. <laughs> I actually did. Yeah, but did you really? Well, no, I worked at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, which is very close to Hollywood. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Okay. So I graduated with my bachelor's in English, mm -hmm. and I ended up at Loyola here in okay. Chicago. Okay. And it is a master's PhD program. Yeah. So I was accepted as a doctoral student. Okay. And it's clinical psychology with a specialty in children and adolescents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have in your head, you're still reading, you're still writing, you have a dad as a writer, right? So this book, which honestly is not how I met you. Well, wait. So I, I think it's important, especially for this podcast, part of the premise is like, you can talk to anyone. Um, but... My step kiddo and one of your kids are in the same class at an elementary school here in Oak Park. And I was going to be on a podcast called Brainy Moms, I think. And I saw your name and I was like in the in the uh, pl the set list. And I was like, wait a minute. I know this from whatever. Right. Like a class picture or something. It's just right. that memory <laughs> I have. And then your name's Emily. And so I reached out to you. And then I learned you had a book, right? I was like, okay, right? I just wonder, 10-year-old you envisioning, like, did you envision this part? No. No. Okay. Beyond what you envisioned? Or did you want to be on Oprah? Or like, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I never envisioned this part. I did envision writing children's books. That was actually what I really wanted to do when I was really? younger. And I wrote a lot of children's stories mm -hmm. when I was a teenager and young adult. Mm-hmm. And will we see? Yeah. Are you making an announcement today? I know. So that the next five-year-old can go to a birthday party with Emily Edmund 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 books <laughs> and get them tossed aside. Yeah. Okay. So you envision kids' books. Yeah. So I did not see this at all. Okay. Yeah. So when did the book seed get planted mm -hmm. then? So I would say you said you were reading and writing. I really didn't when I was in graduate school. Yeah. And so I felt like I just went in this whole different direction intellectually and and creatively, meaning not much creative mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And the whole graduate training and all the steps to get licensed and start working. So then I had my first baby one year into my first job. Okay. And you were working as a therapist? I was working as a psychologist yeah. in Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Okay. On their inpatient pediatric palliative care team. Oh, honey. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So very intense work. Yeah. And, you know, my husband is also a psychologist. So we both have very similarly demanding careers. Mm -hmm. And I was just so amazed being a new mom, how hard it was. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I'm a, like expert 
because I studied psychology in children, but I was not prepared for motherhood. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking at what's out there and I was so disappointed in what I found mm -hmm. and just knew it was wrong. Like, like fundamentally got the science wrong, mm. yet was putting so much pressure on parents to do parenting a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that's when the seeds started. And I would like write chapters in my head about a better parenting book, mm. which I don't even remember because I was sleep deprived with a newborn. But yeah. it, you know, the, <laughs> the impulse was there. <laughs> In that process of, you know, kind of coming to terms with, I have to say something about, like, I ha someone has to write something different. How did you and your husband talk about it and giving birth, presumably, to you? I know you have three children, but this yeah. feels like it was probably a fourth of some sort, the yeah. book, right? What was that process with, like, I'm going to need probably a little space and time mm -hmm. to think about this and... And then I'm also doing the math, Emily, that you thought about it when your first child was one, and now I don't know how old that child is. 14. And the book came out last year. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just doing the math, yeah, right? It right. took a minute. And yeah. I, this is important, I think, for um, sometimes we talk with guests on this podcast about, like, you know, you make a decision mm -hmm. to write a book. First of all, there's a million other decisions that happen next, but, like, the actual thing happening can take some time. Yep. Yeah. So I just asked about four questions. You. Well, I, I will explain the path because I Great. think I love hearing that from other people and it's a nonlinear path. Love it. Right. Yes. So, okay. We ended up going from LA to Denver. By mm -hmm. the time we're in Denver, we have two kids and then we're both working in academic medicine at Children's Hospital of Colorado. We're both assistant professors at University of Colorado, Denver. And it is exhausting. Mm -hmm. Then I get pregnant with a third mm -hmm. and it felt very overwhelming. And I can't remember the exact timing, but my husband got this amazing job opportunity back here in Chicago that was really his ideal position. He's a forensic psychologist mm -hmm. and he was not able to find that work in Denver. And so he was doing work he didn't love. Mm -hmm. And so we made this really huge decision to move our family when we had a one-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-year-old mm. here yeah. to Oak Park. And that gave me the opportunity to evaluate what am I doing with my career and is this the best for me and my family? And when I thought about going and working at the children's hospitals in this area, I just couldn't even face the commute. Mm -hmm. And I just knew like this is the time I need to pivot. Mm -hmm. And so I started writing mm -hmm. and my husband is my cheerleader and he was just like, you need to start writing. This is your chance. Mm -hmm. And so I started the blog first because you have to have a platform to get a publisher's attention in any way. But really what it did for me is helped me refine my voice and my message to even know what I wanted to write a book about. Mm -hmm. So it took a lot of time. I mean, if someone, I started my blog in 2017. Mm. If someone said, you will have your book out in six years, I probably would have been like, yeah, that's too long. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait that long. I'm yeah. going to do something else. <laughs> but when you look back, it's like, but of course it has to take that long. Yeah. 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 Uh, shout out. Is your husband's name Carlos by any chance? No. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> it was um yeah shout out to the cheerleading the supporting and then also just like the one foot in front of the other mm -hmm. do you think you started the blog knowing that you would write a book yes so that was intentional it was the intention yeah i do think people expect much quicker results uh -huh. because well, of the world right. we live in yeah, right? right it's right. like instant gratification you hear yeah. stories all the time of i started a blog and then i got millions of views that is not typically what happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was blood, sweat, and tears. And my blog never took off in any sort of viral way. Mm -hmm. But again, it helped me establish myself, my voice, my messaging. That led to a writing for parents as an advice columnist. Mm -hmm. That's what really put me on the map. So this is how everything connects. My blog was never super viral or successful, whatever successful means. 
but it helped open the door. So it's all about, I think, the gateways, right? Like yeah. what opens the door to the next thing? And then how does that open the door to the next thing? And it just sort of becomes, that becomes the path, but you can't see it. I know. Can't see it. And I hate that <laughs> so much. As you know, I was 10 and I saw my path. <laughs> and now I have no idea what yeah. the path looks like, but I just keep going. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, uh, the. I know you have no idea where it's going. Do you have an idea of where you want it to go? I do. I really, really want to do more speaking yeah. about parenting. I want you to do more too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. What does that look like? Do you want it to be? Yeah. Well, I'm really, really passionate about changing our whole parenting paradigm. It is unhealthy. It's not good for us or our children. And I'm really passionate. So I see speaking, obviously, in schools and kind of traditional places where you find parents, but I also want to cross into other domains like workplaces. And I think there could be a lot of crossover with high achieving women who are struggling with motherhood. And I think I can be a support and a comfort and a guide. I'm uh, nodding vociferously. <laughs> Uh, because I'm thinking about the audiences that I have in front of me, which are always corporate, typically high achieving. When I practiced privately as a clinician, I often saw high achieving mm -hmm. women. Remember Lean In? We're not going to yeah. bash Lean In. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's been harmful yes. is my experience. And I'll just speak for myself and I'd love to hear what your reaction to this would be. I'm a new stepmom. So I'm 44 years old. I don't have children of my own. I fell in love with someone who has a kid. And the kid happens to be amazing. Yeah. Um, and holy shit. Yeah. When I went out into the world, so two, two things. When I got divorced, I could not find, this was five years ago, I couldn't find anyone who was writing about like how great it gets. Mm. And now uh, I don't know her personally, but Liz Lenz has a great book out that just came out um, called The Great American Ex-Wife. And what happens after divorce for some women and the same thing with stepmoms. I found four channels to tune into as, on social media about there's a lot of dynamics that aren't just parenting. Right. But one was like, um, you know, the bio mom sucks, right? Uh, so bashing that. Yeah. One was very Christian, right? Mm -hmm. So follow this way. This is the way. Of, and I know you're nodding also because in parenting, right, there's yeah. like lanes to yes. choose. And then there was also just like, not my kids, not my problem. Wow. And then there was this fledgling <laughs> lane of like, I had a whole life and now I have this life. Yeah. And what the hell am I, how do I do it? In a way that I think what I love about your approach in your book and what you talk about is like in a way that retains my mm. my identity. identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So you saw a similar like, where's the voice of, of the mom, the parent yeah. here? Yeah. 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 The core self. The core self, yeah. yeah. So s tell us about tell us about autonomous parenting. So my book is Autonomy Supportive Parenting, and I'm going to say the subtitle because it's important for Good, this. Good, please do. How to Raise Competent and Confident Children and Reduce Parental Burnout. So a big mission of my book was to have it feel parent-centered, not just do this and do this to raise this kind of child because... First of all, that's a lie. Um, but more parenting is super hard and there are no quick fixes or promises that can be made. But here's a roadmap for how to think about your parenting values and then how to actually do some parenting strategies day to day in real life across toddlers, school age kids, teenagers. And so I think my hope with the book is it really could reach any stage of parenting mm -hmm. and feel relevant to any person, regardless of their context. The Emilies will continue their conversation after a short break. All right, so I wanted to spotlight an organization that my mom was an integral part of forming for many years called Women's Empowerment International. I don't need to hear anything else, but okay, here's what they do. <laughs> they work with high impact nonprofits to empower women around the world. 
with funding for small businesses and education. It's a nonprofit organization that gives grants to support economic empowerment programs for women experiencing poverty around the world. And over the last 20 years, they've given grants worth two and a half million dollars in nine countries. And they're deeply committed to financial literacy, which is so important when women are in provider roles. You can meet the women they've inspired and sustained by visiting womenempowerment.org. I found myself into my parenting journey. I was probably like three or four months. And it took me some time to find, like I said, the the flavor that felt right for me. And as a woman who didn't have kids, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I can't just do this. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I know that my friends who are biological moms to kids feel the same way. So one of the things I love in your book is you talk about how <laughs> this is so true with anything, but like it's a journey. And, you know, there is a goal, but the goal isn't, like you said, you know, my kid's going to be a certain way. It's like, I'm going to retain yes. <laughs> some sense of sanity. Yes. So what feels, I'm just curious in your approach, just even to how you like parented today or parented this week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm laughing. No? Of, okay. Like, parent, Last my, week? <laughs> my husband's been out of town. So. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Own. So what does that look like with how you, and is it fair to say that you also practice this day to day? I do. Okay. And I, so not I, every author does. I right? agree. Of, and yeah, I will say that's why I can really testify to it because yeah. I've truly lived having this mindset shift. Yeah. And of course I was doing components of this before I stumbled onto this whole book process where I was researching it and understanding it in a very deep way. But I have made a lot of changes in my parenting that have really, really made a difference in our family life. At a recent event, this woman said, my husband and I have been reading this book for three weeks and it has already changed our lives. Oh. I mean, that's what every author wants to hear, right? Oh, yeah. But I think, I think there are a lot of myths about what a good parent is. Yeah. And of course, there's not one definition yeah. but I think a lot of times we are parenting in a ways either that we were parented so we think that that's the right way mm. or we're parenting in ways that we feel is the cultural norm and will be judged if we don't do it that way mm -hmm. in today's world mm -hmm. and for me pushing against both of those has been really important to find my identity as a parent and not listen to anyone else. Mm -hmm. But how that might look, just yeah, for an yeah. example, yeah. is I think that parents feel really pressured to, if my child has a transgression, I have to come down hard on them mm -hmm. to really show them and communicate that that was wrong. What happens is kids shut down, they disengage, it hurts the relationship. And so I really have shifted myself into, and as a therapist, it's easier, but not with your own kids. Mm -hmm. Really taking a beat, pausing, mm -hmm. coming at it when I'm not emotional. If there's something that's come up that upsets me, something I hear my child did, or something that is out of our values. And I come to them really curious and open to hear their experience. Mm -hmm. And so approaching some of these kind of conflicts, like even if it's a, a values conflict or an actual conflict, with that mindset, you're better able to teach your child mm -hmm. because they are still connected to you rather than shut down in shame. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big kind of mindset shift for yeah. parents. As you're talking, I'm literally feeling uh, sort of like, I don't know if it was my central nervous system or not, but I literally felt myself relax. So it was like this feeling of lowering the stakes. Yeah. Yes. 
everything feels so intense yeah. and you know even like reading logs did you fill oh. it out is it done what if you're not on the right color what if you and it's just all this and and i think that extrapolates out into this reaction yeah yeah when there is a kid being a kid yeah right yes and we need to remember that our children are wired their brains are under construction it's not done yet right they <laughs> are right. not supposed to be perfectly behaved and have it all together. And so I think the other thing, and I've had parents say, oh, that's really helpful. We need to expect mistakes mm. rather than be surprised and then upset by them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that's how you learn. Totally. And I think it's hard too, right? And you mentioned this in one of um, one of the interviews that I heard you on. You know, it's hard when we've been parented a different way, yeah. right? I mean, I would. My mom's listening too, by the way. Hi, Ruth. Um, you know that for me, it was like if I'm amenable, affable, and agreeable, I'm good. I was a good girl, and being good was good, and that was that. And you know, later on in life, of course, as we all know, it came out in different ways. I mean, yeah. I definitely misbehaved, and it was you know, I had to recover from all of those things. But I, the, you said it earlier, like we didn't talk. This just wasn't. Yeah. There weren't, I mean, there were parenting styles, like, but there certainly was a, maybe there was a book about it. Like, you read them and they were incorrect. Is yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you suppose just as a, as a, as a mom and a clinician moving through this, like, what are you seeing? Is there a proliferation of methods of parenting? Is it getting a little nuts out there? Do you think it's, could be simpler? Like, why is it so hard? I do think we're overcomplicating I things. we are too. A hundred percent. We're just... I think falling into that whole Western mindset of things need to look a certain way, be a certain way, a lot of shoulds, mm. a lot of shoulds mm -hmm. in how things should be happening. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the hyper competition comparison. I think parents really have this drive. It's evolutionary that our mm -hmm. children aren't left behind on the savanna, right? Yeah. But how that's converting into modern day life is, well, they have to get in the best colleges mm -hmm. to live mm -hmm. a good life and be okay when that's actually not true. Mm -hmm. And so I think we don't even question some of these assumptions that are driving our behaviors to be very controlling of our kids and hard on them mm -hmm. and creating pressure when we love them fiercely. This is out of so much love, mm -hmm. but we're just kind of all upside down about it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Do you are, I'm imagining you now, I just had this vision of like, um, where we actually were going to meet for coffee today and then we decided to, and, and record a podcast. And then we decided we're just going to put it all into one. When you're out with your friends, well, how is it going with friendships for you? First of all, <laughs> let's start there. It's hard to make time. I mean, it's so hard. I know. The reason I want to talk about friends is like, I'm having this vision of you being out with a friend or friends or just being out and people find out what you do. And then like, they have all the questions yeah. for you and you have all the answers, right? Always. And <laughs> Always. How do you navigate like also having a life that is right. rich and not just this thing, right? Yeah. Well, I think one of two things seems to happen. This is my guess. Either people think I have all the answers and I'm just like, I don't know, that sounds really hard. Or, um, or I worry, and this could be all in my head, that when people find out I'm a child psychologist, they actually go arm's length because they don't want me analyzing their mm -hmm. child, which I'm not going to yeah. do. But... Um, but I don't know. I, I just, no one has ever said that to me, obviously, but sometimes I wonder, mm -hmm. you know, if there's a little separation mm -hmm. because of what I do. I don't know if this is true for you, but I feel like what I do is who I am. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of people that don't identify as that. Yeah. And that's fine right. too, right? Right. And so I had the same thing happen. I was driving with a, a senior partner at a law firm who was a client and we were going somewhere and they were like, I'd really like to be friends with you, but I'm worried that you would analyze me. And I was like, I just, I, to me, it was like, what? Uh, and I get it. I get it. Because part of what's brought us to the professions that we're in 
is that we are like every interaction I hope with me and I think you hope this for you too is therapeutic mm -hmm. right we're not trying there's not a lot of burned bridges as yeah. I look back yeah I'm right. trying to live a life that right. like you know has a lot of empathy and, right yeah but I I was thinking even just navigating in like um you know having children of your own and parents and teachers and like I, I had in my head, maybe it would be like people were asking you inappropriate things at inappropriate times and having no boundaries, but well, that maybe that's too high drama. That happens with like Uber drivers. And, oh, sure. yeah. So I've just, yeah. I don't say anymore what I do to do you strangers. Have something else you say? I don't know what I say, <laughs> but I will say, honestly, I think it's harder to be known as quote parenting expert than child psychologist. <sighs> What I think that puts parents, people dude? off because they're is like, "What it with parents? <laughs> Why is it so?" Because I'm like, I really want the best for everyone. I think parents worry I'll judge their parenting. Yeah. I think that so I'm having this experience as sort of a new to this community mm -hmm. and and finding your book. By the way, Arnie and I are going to read it together. Oh, I good. Think. I've heard really good things about spouses reading it yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we're not the first family. Yeah. So with steps, you have a whole market with steps too, by the way. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm already thinking of places <laughs> you can speak. Um, but with steps, you know, you have to really, or step families, you have to like create the values of this mm -hmm. unit, right? And I'm finding that there's a lot, there, it's just constant judgment, mm -hmm. constant mm -hmm. judgment um, that is like how you should be doing it or what a stepmom's role is or what a mom's role is, what a dad, oh, yeah. the role stuff. Yes. And then I'm looking at the kid, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this kid is, I, I mean, just the kid in my life, but also kids in general, yeah. they're amazing. They're yeah. just doing their thing. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder about like, can you speak a bit to the benefits of this sort of autonomy sport of parenting, but also focusing on yourself in order for the kid to benefit? Like how right. does it benefit the kid? Yeah. So, well, for one, there's tons of research on this, right? Great. Parent well-being predicts child well-being. Right. And in the autonomy supportive science, those parents whose needs are met in the three main areas of autonomy, competence, and relatedness, mm. those parents are better able to do autonomy supportive parenting. Which mm -hmm. makes sense because it's the whole idea of like filling your own bucket, you know, first. Mm -hmm. You can't fill your kids from an empty bucket. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I'm like, you have to put your needs first, not in an emotionally neglectful way where it's always all about the parent. That is not the message because those parents are a different, <laughs> yeah. different, different breed. Yeah. They're not reading my book, <laughs> but it's like... <laughs> it's the regular parent who feels like they're supposed to yeah. sacrifice everything for their child to be a good parent. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true. It has the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to raise entitled kids. That's raising entitled kids who yeah. get the message that they're the center of the universe. Why is it so hard then if there's all these benefits? I mean, I'm just like, I get it, right? But then there's that moment. Mm -hmm. There's that moment where... You know, and I hear this all the time now that I'm parenting. It's like where you're like choosing whether you handle the meltdown or yeah, you just right. give it, right? It's just like, what do I, and like no shame, no yeah, shade at all right. to like, if you just want to put the Doritos in the hand and that yeah. solves it, we get it. But it seems like it's hard to, for anything to like extrapolate out the benefits over time of mm -hmm. what you're talking about. That must be yes. part of why it's so hard, right? It's yeah. not. Right. No. And that's where the values piece comes in too, to like keep us grounded in the why mm -hmm. when the moment is hard. And I talk a lot in my book about we're always on a continuum mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have grace for ourselves as well, that we're, our best is going to change day to day. And we do our best with what we got mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. move on mm -hmm. when we have a rough day because it will always happen mm -hmm. and there mm -hmm. will be better days mm -hmm. so it's just kind of having that bigger picture perspective I think one thing about modern day parenting advice especially I'm going to call out gentle parenting is okay. it's so it puts so much pressure on each and every interaction mm -hmm. as if every little thing we do is going to determine the future 
of our relationship and our child. And so I think parents yeah, feel, feel that. Yeah. like terrified to ruin things mm -hmm. by saying the wrong thing, reacting, all of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just not healthy. Mm -hmm. And our kids are so much sturdier than we give them credit for. They can handle it. Mm -hmm. They're going to be okay. In fact, they're better when they see us being human because then they know that they can be human mm -hmm. and talk through mm -hmm. when things go sideways. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's better for their future relationships. So. Totally. And I feel like there's people our age who, like, this is novel, mm -hmm. right? That conflict actually can create. Yes. You repair it. And yes. then it's like, you're even closer. Yes, exactly. And I, I'm thinking to myself, like, that didn't happen. I didn't realize that until I was 42. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I had the chance to have an adult in my life who is like, I still love you, even though all this other exactly. messy stuff. And I, so now... Now, Emily, I have that skill, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have had that unless I had another adult in my yep. life to help teach me at this age. Yeah. So I think about parents with kids and like they didn't have that either. And they're like, oh, shit, I got to try this <laughs> with my kid. And it can feel. Yeah. So we have to be so aware of our emotions yeah. and knowing what's going on inside of us and what's not our kids. Being therapy ours. parents. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But that self-awareness is huge yeah. and being kind to yourself about it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is there anything as we think about um, permissions you mm -hmm. want to give? Can you speak to the mom out there who's doing the most, maybe hasn't read Fair Play by Eve Rodsky right. yet? Shout <laughs> out to Eve Rodsky. Yeah. Love. Like, Love. read that. Yeah. Then read Emily Edlin's book. Okay. Like, and this is the <laughs> starter pairing. package. It's a good pairing. Honestly. Yeah. I'm about to do it. Yeah. So I'll keep you posted how it goes. But yeah, permission you want to give them just today to do or to stop doing. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. It's like you read my mind. My, my um, working tagline right now that I have not floated. So this is breaking news. Oh my gosh. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Do less parenting mm. do less for more yes your children will learn more grow more and do more themselves mm -hmm. if we are doing less mm. so i think it's permission to do less love it we don't have to do parenting so hard I know. that's what i see everywhere yeah, like resist the impulse. You want to get up off the couch and make that snack? Unless it brings you joy. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't make the snack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that's not, that's hard. Thank you, Emily E. To no one's surprise, she has some great recommendations. You can find them at whosmissingpodcast.com. And please share this conversation if something stuck out to you right now in the app, on your computer, wherever you are. Copy the link and send it to a friend who could stand to hear what Emily had to say today. And thanks for listening. What are you nerdy about right now? What are you like so into? What are you obsessed with? Anything? Well, in the very micro my yeah. nerd alert this past few weeks have been a jigsaw puzzle. I can't stop. It's just so soothing. Oh. And I love it. Is it silent? Are you listening to anything? What do you like to... You know, I am a huge podcast listener. Yeah. But I have done a lot of silent yeah. puzzling. It's been really nice. Silent puzzle. <laughs> oh my God. That sounds really great. <laughs> <laughs>